Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Mani Kiran. Um, this presentation is going to be slightly different than what you have seen so far. This is about practitioner's perspective. So we decided to do an experiment as a way of learning semantic model as well as about FIBO implementation. Uh, a few years ago, we did ontology-based semi-structured data management solution. Uh, currently, we are converting the ontology into SCOS. And it was a successful implementation. So we are always trying to introduce some innovation in managing the data uh, in our organization. Uh, we have been working on the enterprise data architecture almost uh, every day-to-day -day activities are all enterprise data architecture only. So we thought, since we successfully implemented ontology for semi-structured data management, why can't we push that into the structured data world? That's how this project started. Um, so I'm here with uh, two of my information architects, Guy Kim and Preeti Sharma. Why three people for a simple presentation, 30 minutes presentation, right? This is a journey for us. We have just been in the journey. It is going to take some time. It takes a village for a significant amount of journey. That's why we are starting like this. This one. OK. I'm going to start with this uh, enterprise architecture diagram. It is a very generic diagram. You might have seen this in your own organization or somewhere else, somewhere else uh, different variations. Uh, on the left-hand side is the sourcing of the data. On the right-hand side, on the right, the consumer of the data, right? So the, in the center, enterprise repositories. In the center place, as well as the right-hand side, is more focused on data. They're all data-centric applications in any organization. On the left-hand side, especially on the top, the OLTP and other applications are uh, very process-centric applications, very important applications built to solve a particular business problem, highly optimized for that function. The process and data are very tightly interlinked. Now, that's fine, but if you want to exchange data, share the data across the organization, it becomes difficult because without the context, we can't read the data. So there is a 90s, you know, when there is a lot of distributed database application built. That's how it exploded. Now, in the last decade and a half, when we started building enterprise data warehouse, ODS solutions, uh, the data was trying to come to ODS, and uh, the brunt of the work was taken by ETL the transformation, business rules, all those information. Uh, but that didn't work. Uh, it became a very expensive proposition. So, okay, transaction data can come to ODS or data warehouse. Let's build an MDM solution in the last few years to integrate the data at the context level, at the master data domain level. And then it was sent to, let's say, ODS for master data to the data warehouse, confirm dimensions, class schemes, all those things. So we thought if MDM solution is the one that is going to give the context of the transaction data, why can't you apply the ontology there to bring some smartness into MDM? That is the genesis of this particular experiment. So what is MDM? Let me not go into the detail. This is a, a truth about a particular data domain like product or client or instrument. Um, everybody has its own, their own definition. But one thing I would like to highlight here is the semantic consistency that uh, even Gartner defines that. So that means if you have to bring the data from disparate sources, it has to mean uh, this. You need to understand what the data really mean. The semantic consistency is very important. So it is very sweet spot for us in applying the ontology. So in any uh, real-world problem, when you build the MDM solution, the first problem we are going to see is the data silos, right? Everybody has built their own application, highly optimized, functional, process-oriented. It can be based on a business line, like equity versus fixed income, or organization itself, 
uh, different geographic location or uh, subsidiaries, or it can be based on a function, a trading system versus an accounting system or a marketing system. So all those data silos have to be integrated to build the MDM. For example, a typical use case, I want to know the counterparty ID. The counterparty ID may come from multiple places. A third party system like a Bloomberg, or a back office system, or a front office system, uh, or a trading desk, all may have different IDs for the same counterparty. Also, we don't know what they mean by an ID. Do they really mean the same thing or not? So we need to bring them, scrub them, clean them, master them. So the problem is multiple identifier, inconsistent class scheme. All those have to be resolved at the master data management level before the data can be ex exchanged for downstream applications. Right? So this is one example. We don't want to go through a lot of examples, but we put all of them into three categories. Uh, one is rationalization, classification, and standardization. So rationalization is bringing data from multiple systems like trading and portfolio system, remove the redundancies, and rationalize them and keep it them into in the repository, MDM repository. Classification is making sure the MDM system can accommodate multiple perspectives, multiple viewpoints, uh, regulatory view versus marketing view, for, for example. So we, we need to make sure that we capture them. Uh, the standardization is a particular legal entity may play multiple roles, may deal with multiple securities, multiple transactions. All those have to be standardized. If you don't standardize, then all the downstream system may have inconsistent way of using the same data. <coughs> so it's less usable. So uh, in a perfect data model world, it is really difficult to accomplish this one if you want to have a perfect data model in the traditional technologies. The expensive part of MDM is the initial phase, requirements engineering and design, and there is a disconnect between requirements engineering and design. The problem is we have data silos. That means we are talking to multiple business partners. They have their own language. So we need to understand multiple languages and come up with a common language. We need to capture their commonalities as well as variations in our model. And then we have to show it back to them, entity relationship diagram. And they may not understand our design either. So unless you test the MDM system way down during development and testing, we are not really sure we, ca we captured the real knowledge or not. So to eliminate the expensive requirements engineering, we thought let's bring um, ontology-based uh, modeling technique, easy to capture, easy to visualize, easy to communicate with the business. Uh, based on the RDF and OWL technologies, uh, there is a very good infrastructure behind it. And uh, we thought use FIBO for this, you don't have to start from scratch. Don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, use the FIBO to explain and capture the differences or customization that we need to make. That's how we started. So this experiment or proof of concept is not about a tool, not about a particular technology, but it's a proof of concept of testing the semantic model itself or testing the semantics portion of our business process or business model. Um, so this whole presentation is about a laboratory report, you can say. So if this laboratory report experiment is successful, then we have to do a field study. Uh, that is the journey that is going to take us along. And if we find interesting results, we'll come back to some forum to show the results. Now I'm going to give it to Guy to quickly explain the proof of concept methodology uh, follow. I'm going to share our, uh, our experience, our, experience our, our POC experience. What we did was um, uh, we did a semantic testing, which means we did not uh, do perform the technical testing. So what we did is um, we played with Protege. Uh, by playing with Protege, we imported five ontology directly into our um, 
what is the environment as a data model, as a complete set of data model. And we populated sample, sample data. We created sample data uh, considering all, some of the business situations we, we encounter during our everyday life project. And we query through that uh, data store. So first step is um, importing Fiber as a data model. Here are two, two, uh, two, uh, two perspectives. First thing is um, we imported data model. We, we did not create any data model from the scratch. Instead of collecting user requirement and um, uh, defining uh, data dictionary, data element, instead of doing that, we just imported Fiber from EMD, EMD counts site and then OMG site. So definitely we don't have a full set of uh, ontology yet because the fiber is ongoing effort, but um, still we have a very nice uh, resource as a starting point. So once we imported the fiber into our protege environment, we could visualize it, visualize it using, our, using our protege uh, plugins, and then um, we could have a discussion with our potential business users, and um, validate the model, discuss upon it, and, um, and we try to make it more fitable to our business practice by adding new ontology, modifying it, and uh, tweaking it. Once we did that, uh, next step is um, uh, populating sample data, creating sample data, considering uh, some of the real business situation. So we created uh, some named individual into that ontology as a new data instance, and we added um, property assertions uh, to, describe, uh, to, uh, to describe that entities. And here, uh, we could also observe very interesting perspective. Actually, in a traditional approach, this is where we encountered all those three problems, rationalization, standardization, and classification. Because um, within relational database, data mastering usually, uh, actually means we need to squeeze in uh, all the data from the multiple silos into one certain uh, data schema. So it, during that phase, uh, we usually lose, uh, lose lose much part of data context, data semantics. But um, it, within this approach, we don't need to do that. Because um, integrating data, uh, populating data means um, we are adding new information, new knowledge as a statement. So we are just adding statement by statement, not losing any context, and um, we still have a um, very nice set of data. The final step is querying. Uh, one of the things uh, which excited us very much was um, within this ontology world, we can use infer inferencing uh, functionality. So we ch uh, choose a uh, DL query uh, as our main query interface. Well, we use it, it combined, combined with the uh, Hermit regional. So we compared uh, two uh, approaches from the query, well, one from the secure tra uh, traditional SQL world and the other one from the, this inferencing world. So to prove uh, this really works and that you can change our uh, like a data modeling life, the data uh, management pr practice, uh, we brought, brought up with um, some competence question. We did main, test, uh, we did, uh, main testing queries that we encountered in, during, while we are in, uh, implementing many business reports. But um, for this particular presentation, I brought up uh, some very specific question, which was asked by uh, that Frank Act. In the financial industry, everybody knows that um, this regulatory regime, regulatory framework is the main driver for the master of data management challenge, challenge. Whenever we come up with a new regulatory regime, we need to implement new uh, analytics, new reporting, and uh, we need to change some of our the master data management perspective. Uh, how can we see that, uh, see that the new challenge? We, uh, we, are, we saw that challenge in two perspectives. First one is um, top-down perspective. Top -down pers Perspective means when new requirement, new regulatory requirement come, uh, comes in, it is asking, asking us to answer some specific question, like a total exposure ex uh, situation. So what is your total exposure to a certain counterparty? When you ask, the, ask uh, this question, we need to go through all the information that we store in our database, and we need to find all the relationship between them, and we need to plot all the relevant inf information at the same time. On the other side, there's also a bottom-up perspective. We have a business expanding every day. We are having new securities, new strategies, new account, new product every day. And then every, everything is just siloed. But um, still, we need to combine every information into certain criteria to meet a certain uh, regu regulatory requirement. 
So from here, I'm going to hand this over to my uh, colleague, Priti Sharma. So she's going to share our observation on uh, top-down example. Thank you, Guy. So I'm going to talk about the top-down example, the first competency question about the total exposure. So before I delve down into the um, details of what we did in the POC, the total exposure um, question, why does it come um, like through the further from the regulatory reporting perspective? So after the 2008 crisis, as we know, in 2010, uh, the Dodd-Frank Act was signed. And it brought in um, many uh, regulatory reforms uh, to make um, uh, more transparent, transparency or to bring more transparency in the financial industry. So um, one of the, um, or some of the common themes these regulatory reforms had was that you need to know who you're dealing with. You need to know your legal entities, your counterparties. You may be dealing with um, the counterparties um, in, um, with the same in legal entity in multiple roles. That legal entity may be a security issuer, it may be a counterparty to your contract, it may be the obligor or um, a, a broker. Uh, so there, there can, they, they can, the same legal entity can play multiple roles. And also you may be dealing with certain subsidiaries of a legal entity where these subsidiaries have uh, enhanced ratings or some hidden uh, sector classification which you're not aware of. But in order to make sure that you understand them in case they um, default, so it should not have like a lot of negative impact um, on your business, you need to really understand them. So what do you need to know about them? So you need not only need to know who that legal entity is, what is the legal entity identifier, you also need to know what their uh, legal uh, and corporate hierarchy looks like. Um, what are their subsidiaries that you may be dealing with through your contracts, through the transactions? Um, what is their um, credit rating profile? Uh, what, cert what certain sectors, industries, or countries they, are, um, they, may ex they may have exposure to because indirectly you would have also have the exposure to those sectors and those countries. And there are many more um, things that you need to, um, you need to know. So uh, when you put all these things together, it really adds to the complexity um, of that uh, total exposure question. So I'm going to uh, go back to this particular slide that Mani had shared earlier about the reference architecture. To answer that question about the counterparty exposure, um, where does the data reside? So either it would reside in your master data management systems, if you have one, or you will have to directly go to the source systems to get this data. Now, this data might not exist in a single source system because um, on the left-hand side, the sources are very, very process-centric. So you may become, have the, the legal entity information itself may be coming from one system and their um, transactional like subsidiaries information, the brokers and um, counterparty information may be coming from some other system. So once you have identified the source systems, now you need to know like within one source system, which day table columns does the data um, resides. So you need to know the data, data architecture, the data model, and once you have identified the table columns, now where is the semantic? What business logic do I need to write to, um, to answer that query? So someone who is knowledgeable in the data needs to tell you the business rules so that you can write your query in a SQL uh, query or in the PLSQL code. So this is from a single system and if you have to now gather the data from multiple systems and the, it just adds to the complexity of your query and if something on the, um, on the question itself changes then you have to come back and modify your business logic, your query rules um, and then get the answers. So this is how it is done on the relational world. Now we wanted to see how we can do it um, using a semantic model, um, the FIBO model. So we used the um, uh, FIBO uh, ontologies and we basically um, used the business entity ontology and the security um, uh, ontology. 
And we uh, loaded, imported these ontologies in Protege, and we loaded some sample data, and um, uh, specifically to look at, like, uh, for the business, uh, for the legal entity question, you know, all those aspects about who the legal entity is, what are their subsidiaries, their sector uh, classification, uh, their domicile countries, and all. So after adding the data and using the relationships, after asserting those relationships, we could get this kind of graph where in a single graph you could see that for a, a legal entity like Vodafone, what are the subsidiaries, what are the countries of domiciles, what are the various sectors. And some of these were asserted relationships and some of these were inferred relationships using uh, Protege Reasoner. So within a single graph, we could get to um, all the information about a legal entity. Um, and if you have to now query, um, like what, is, what are the subsidiaries of a particular legal entity, just writing a single line of code, you, you are able to do it. Another example um, is, uh, what is the exposure uh, to a legal entity through a contract? So you have a swap contract, the contract has two, swap, two legs, and each leg has a counterparty. So this is what we have asserted in the model. Now, can I know, because of this contract through the subsidiaries, what is my exposure to the ultimate parent? Or what is my exposure to the sector of those ultimate parents? So uh, what we did here was we introduced a new property, new object property, and we specified the business rules for that new object property. And by introducing this new object property, um, it the, uh, and by running the Hermit Reasoner, it was automatically inferred that for, uh, for a swap contract, what is the contract ultimate um, party? And now the same thing, swap contract, swap legs, counterparties, and now we can, through inferencing, we can figure out what, ours, what is the exposure to the um, ultimate uh, counterparty. To, so, so to summarize, um, we can um, do the counterparty question through the relational data models. Uh, we are doing it today, but um, uh, any, as any other company would be doing it. But we just wanted to see how it would um, look like using the FIBO model, and it looks quite promising. So we would continue our experiments um, uh, with FIBO. And um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Guy, who is going to talk about the second competency question of the bottom-up approach. Thanks, Preeti. OK, uh, so let me uh, go back to bottom-up example. So bottom-up example was this. How can you rebuild, how can you reclassify existing in, um, like a product or a financial instrument uh, into new classification scheme to meet new regulatory regime? So here's just some example. If you see this diagram, this button box, it shows just um, some of um, very typical classification scheme for financial instrument. I believe many of financial companies have uh, some of code system like that. So when you design this classification scheme, classification uh, like a grouping scheme, the main idea is this: we want to define the, this class, classification scheme uh, at the most detailed level. So we can combine this bubble into a new classification scheme like in the, with a hierarchical structure. So we had the IRS, CDS, TRS, and the forward swaps and everything, and we believe that this should work going forward. But when that Frank Act came into uh, play, uh, here now we have a new concept, which is a cleared and uncleared swap. Before then, the swap was the swap. IRS was the IRS, and the CDS was the CDS. But then from now on, we need to make a business reporting saying, OK, this is IRS, but then also it's a cleared swap. This is a CDS, but then also not un uncleared swap. And what's the big deal? Why we cannot solve this problem in our traditional relational database? Actually, logically, it should, it should not be a big deal. We can just add a new column, add a new entity, and then every, everything should uh, work fine. But real, real, reality is actually not work in, in that way. Because um, every step of changing data model for master data is uh, very pain, painful. Gathering requirement, designing entity, it's painful. For, for instance, what is clear the swap? How we can define that? Can you just add a new, col new column to existing security master? What do we need to define central clearing house? Then what is central clearing house? Is it a new entity or is it just a subset of an existing legal entity? So everything, every step takes a lot of time and we need to decide. 
And uh, even though we finalized the design and approach, implementation itself is very painful because um, once we add new column to data, existing database, we cannot leave it as a null value. We need to go back to the old historical data and we need to fill up the column, which means we need a migration process. So for this reason, actually this, this type of data model changes that never happens in the master data level. What we did is um, we usually implement this complex business logic to classify clear the swap and un unclear the swap in the presentation layer. So we can see this classification only at the business reporting. Actually, this is one of the major reasons why we cannot match two numbers in the two reports, even though they are actually meaning the same thing. Uh, and the, the worst part, part is um, actually we are getting worse and worse. Because um, in the financial world, we have a very different type of data producer and data consumer. When you design master data, usually that happens from the front office side which uh, they are introducing new securities, new contracts, new type of derivatives, and new strategy, new account every day. And when they design master data, if, that, if this meets only the require, some of the requirements from accounting side, it's just good, good, uh, good enough to be used. But then usually, the data consumers are like a product control, risk management function, or compliance. They have a very different perspective than data producer. So as long as we have a dis dis discrepancy between data producer and data consumer, we will have this uh, bottom-up pro uh, problem. Then um, how uh, we, we could do with this um, ontology definition? We, uh, firstly, we introduced some of the uh, five definition related to this concept. And then we found, uh, just we found this, okay, uh, until now, in the, within FIBO, we don't have a um, ontology for central clearing house. So we've defined it. We just defined it as a new, new node. And then we defined that cleared swap means a um, subset of derivative contract which have a, cent a central clearing house as a counterparty. And it automatically defines the concept of the cleared swap and un uncleared swap. And once we extended that ontology, defining new classification is also easy. All it did is um, just we uh, stated definition of the new classification as a new DR query, and we re registered it as a new ontology. And um, now we have a clear swap. Uh, this was a quite a simple experiment, but um, from this small set of in 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 ex experiment was good enough to show us that uh, this can be a new like opportunity in master data management. Because um, we can, by leveraging FIBO and we, by accepting it as a new data model, we can reduce much part, much, much part of our requirement engineering and the design. So this can be actually change our uh, life as a data model and information architecture architect. How, however, um, actually we are in the very early, uh, early stage of this experiment. So the remaining question is um, how can you build actual system, actual enterprise system out of this concept? How can you build a system which meets, uh, which meets a service level requirement for enterprise-wide system? So that is the remaining question. What we did was uh, an experiment, hands-on experiment. We acted as the business analyst. Uh, we acted as the ontologist. And we created two competency questions. And we created a simple uh, uh, ontology extension to FIBO and loaded the data, sample data, and we experimented. It is very, very promising. So in our journey, next step is going to be expand the experiment into a real field study, integrate our internal systems with uh, good infrastructure, like a triple store, and we need to really evaluate that. Now, are we going to integrate the relational database or not? load all the products, instruments, and counterparties, and do a thorough next level of uh, proof of concept, or a pilot project, you may say. And if that is successful, then we are going to create a solution architecture to go along with it. Uh, we still have to decide, are we going to have a soft coupling or hot coupling, you know, separate draft database or combination of the relational database, all those things we are going to evaluate. If you find anything interesting, we'll come back to some forum to show. Uh, again, uh, we really enjoyed uh, working with the FIBO and EDM Council's uh, uh, contribution in this area. 
but uh, to extend the ontology, uh, the FIBO, in the areas of investment management, uh, we are willing to collaborate with you, especially in the product instrument, other areas. And also, we request other um, partners to share the customization and implementation best practices so that we can grow together, uh, create the knowledge together. Thank you very much. So before a question, let me also make some comments. So uh, excellent presentation and excellent work, uh, Franklin Templeton guys. Um, now, uh, we're really interested in welcoming partnership and some of the work that you've done identifying some gaps in FIBO that uh, there, and there are plenty because we're still very embryonic. And so some of the areas where uh, it's important to fill some of those gaps uh, is where we're looking for uh, all of our partners to feed us information so that we can prioritize that. And we're developing a mechanism by which we can, uh, I wouldn't say crowdsource yet, but I would say that we'll be uh, accelerating and expanding the ability to feed input into the FIBO team so that we can capture the requirements. And this will be much, this will be forthcoming uh, as we further define our uh, methodology and capabilities to capture that input. Uh, but also, most importantly, we are looking for uh, partners to roll up the sleeves and partner with us in many of the FIBO content teams. So we have one in uh, financial business and commerce where um, uh, Elisa Kendall is heading that one up and some of the uh, areas for like clearinghouse, et cetera. If it's not already there, it needs to be there. Uh, yeah, thought so. Uh, so we got that one. Uh, but derivatives is an area where you guys have done work and we've done a lot of prototype work, which will be interesting to stay tuned tomorrow uh, where State Street did a proof of concept in derivatives. So we should get you guys together. Absolutely. So uh, this, this was really good. So uh, any, any questions. other questions? Yes. Sure. See, we have been working in this industry for a long time. So we understand the business processes and the business domain very well. You don't need to have a lot of knowledge of FIBO, but you should be willing to do uh, jump in and start swimming by looking at the documentation and uh, play with it. So initial playing around with the FIBO is the difficult thing, the first uh, four weeks probably. Uh, it's not difficult. It is uh, kind of sadomasochistic, right? You need to enjoy it. Um, but the whole thing may be six weeks. Yeah, six weeks it took for us to, from scratch, well, three of us. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.